This video is an outreach of Unity Christian Church, 5255 South Linden Road, Swartz Creek, Michigan. I am Brenda Etheridge, pastor and teacher. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, the mission of Unity Christian Church is to lead people to Jesus Christ and to encourage one another on our faith journey. Bible readings are from the New Revised Standard Version and commentary is from Feasting on the Word. Editing and music from the public domain by George Etheridge. Our subject today is a visit with Jesus. Our scripture reading is from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. And it reads, Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things, but few things are needed. Indeed, only one. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Thanks be unto God for the reading and the hearing of God's word. When Jesus decided to drop in on Martha and her sister Mary, Martha's first impulse was to get something going in the kitchen. In doing this, she was being faithful to the tradition of hospitality began long ago when Father Abraham welcomed three guests to his tent. We read that in Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 10. Just as Abraham turned to Sarah to assist with the duties of hospitality, Martha expected Mary to do the same. Martha's expectation didn't include Mary's plopping down on the rug at Jesus' feet and leaving all the work to her. That, however, is exactly what her sister did. Mary was in no hurry to come into the kitchen. While Martha was flipping through cookbooks, boiling the water, chopping up the vegetables, and setting the table for 15, Mary settled down at the feet of their friend and guests, attended to what he was saying. In fact, by sitting at Jesus' feet, Mary had taken the posture of a disciple. Who could blame Martha for banging a few pots and putting the plates on the table with a sturdy thumb? Perhaps Jesus heard the bustling around back there and after a while, even the muttering, Martha was not one to keep her feelings under a tight lid. Since Jesus was pretty sharp at gauging what was going on in people's hearts, he knew what the muttering was all about. Long before Martha's frustration exploded into words, but he waited until Martha spoke. Lord, Martha began, don't you care? showing that Mary wasn't the only one under scrutiny. Don't you care? She repeated. And then the glaze fell on Sister Mary, that my sister has left me by myself to do the serving. As a matter of fact, Jesus did not care. I'd like to think he smiled when he said, Martha, my dear friend, 
you are worried and distracted by many things. This is an important moment to notice in this story. He's not going after busy Martha, but worried and distracted Martha. He's speaking to his dear friend, Martha, who has worked herself into a state of anxious distraction over the meal she wanted to have for him. She has focused her, her frustration not only on her sister, but now also on her friend and guest. And she's lost sight of the one she significantly called Lord. Jesus is genuinely and gently calling her to refocus. Hospitality is not primarily about food. More important, is the focus. Theologian John Shea observed that while in English we hear that Mary has chosen the better part, in Greek the word is translated as good. You see, Mary has chosen the good part, meaning she has chosen the connection to God who is good the ground and energy of effective action. He sees the story not as reinforcing a Martha-Mary dichotomy, but calling for a recognition that God is both inside and outside, sustaining us while summoning us to work and through our service, to bring about a world of justice, mercy, and peace. It is not a either or message, but a both and message. A few years ago, Tom Friedman had a column on the op-ed page of the New York Times called The Taxi Driver. He told of being driven by cab from Charles de Gaulle Airport to Paris. During the one hour drive, he and the driver had done six things. The driver had driven the cab, talked on his cell phone and watched a video, which was a little nerve wracking. Whereas he had been riding, working on a column, on his laptop and listening to his iPod. There was only one thing we never did, he said, and that's talk to each other. Friedman went on to quote Linda Stone, a technologist who had written that the disease of the internet age is continuous partial attention. Perhaps it's not only the disease of the internet age, perhaps it has always been with us and just the cause of our inattention has altered. Mary apparently was eager to be a disciple, sitting as she did at Jesus's feet, spellbound by his words, there's no telling how long she had been wrapped when Martha reaches the limit of her selfless tolerance and interrupts to ask if Jesus cared about the injustice his presence has caused. Save for Martha's outburst, we imagine the same scene in countless houses as the 40 set out to proclaim the gospel. Some must have gathered to hear what the disciples had to say while others busied themselves at table service. So it goes in most households, including the household of faith. 
Some are destined to live out their discipleship in the details of common life. You know, preparing meals, counting money, caring for the homebound, organizing outreach to the poor. Others are disciples in service to the word, study and prayer, worship and preaching, evangelism and teaching. Both are necessary. As Luke soon will acknowledge in the book of Acts, especially in Acts 6 verses 1 through 6, but in these two scenes, Luke privileges the latter. There is need for only one thing. Mary had cho has chosen the better part, Jesus says. What does this imply about the ordering of our lives towards sanctification and service within the church today? More to the point of Luke's story, how are we to show hospitality when the kingdom of God comes near? As Joel Green is, no, if Joel Green is correct, when he writes that Jesus' encounter with Mary and Martha clarifies the nature of the welcome he seeks out not only for himself, but also for his messengers. That is, for all who participate in the drawing near of God's dominion. When a community that is hospitable to Christ is a community marked by the attention the community gives to God's word, a church that has been led to be worried and distracted by many things inevitably will be a community that dwells on the shallows of frantic potlucks and anxious stewardship campaigns and even designed and events simply designed to perpetuate the institution. Decisions will be made in meetings without a hint of God's reign. Food and drink will appear at table without Christ being recognized in the breaking of bread. Social issues might be addressed, but the gospel is missed in acts that partake of politics as usual. This often leads a congregation to get downright honoring. Meeting after meeting, we leave home to crank out the church, uh, out the church and return as clueless and empty as we were when we walked out the door. Endless meetings breed resentment in otherwise pleasant Christians because the church's business is being done without any word of the God whom we thought we had agreed to serve. Martha comes to mind. If we miss the one needful thing, if we do not give singular attention to the address of God in season and out, then we should not be surprised when the nominating committee turns up with an empty slate. But on the other hand, when we as a congregation are led to position ourselves at Jesus' feet, reading scripture together and asking about its meaning, listening to substantive sermons and wrestling like Jacob with God's blessing, studying and nurturing a faith that seeks understanding, then even the details of the 
common life began to resound with good news. Luke's casual setting for this story is a home, a reminder that every gathering is potentially an occasion to listen for God's word and to participate in the drawing near of God's dominion. Some of the most profound moments in ministry begin when we join a dinner party where an off-the-cuff question provides the opening for a conversation about life's meaning and purpose. Or we enter a hospital room where another's physical vulnerability leads to a confession concerning a crisis of faith. Or we arrive late at a meeting and manage to turn a mundane discussion toward the ministry of life and the mystery of life together. Still, there is the matter of the necessary work into which some are thrown when God's dominion draws near. Luke not only presumes people would be in the kitchen preparing food and drink for the 70 on a mission, he also acknowledges the need for a standing office composed of seven of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who would be given the task of waiting on tables what then should the church make of Jesus' rebuke of Martha, for whom the devil apparently was in the details? The nature of hospitality for which Jesus seeks, writes Green, is realized in attending to one's guests. Yet Martha's speech is centered on me talk. Though she refers to Jesus as Lord, she is concerned to engage his assistant in her plans, not to learn from him. When anxiety is being, is, and well-being becomes the measure of our hospitality, then the church has forgotten the one whom it has been gathered to serve. When Jesus is proclaimed as instrumental to the church program, then the community has ceased to attend to the word that first called it to, into being. You and I are in the service of Christ as by his grace, we forget ourselves. Such acts of service, says Karl Barth, are usually done in concealment so that by their very nature, no great glory can attach to them and they can be undertaken and executed only as pure, selfless, and unassuming service which might well be hampered or even totally spoiled by even occasional attempts at domination. Humility is the only conceivable position when in word and sacrament, the kingdom of God draws near. In this regard, only one comes to mind. No doubt when dinner was finally served that night at Martha and Mary's house, the guest was revealed in the breaking of bread to be their hospitable, humble, hidden host. Is it possible that this story of two sisters 
offers us an ongoing plea from the Lord to focus on him, to give him some prime time, some continuous, full attention, just as we do for our close friends, or at least this is what we do if we want to keep them as close friends. The same Lord calls us to focus on him. When we gather on Sunday to move from our place of being worried and distracted by many things to one where you and I are in touch with the one thing needed, the good part that will not be taken away. There, we will connect with the source that brings both peace and energy in all our undertaking. Thanks be unto God. My brothers and sisters, we invite you to believe the good news of God's abounding love in Jesus Christ. By confessing faith in Christ and being baptized into his church, we are given new life. Through faith and baptism, we receive life in the spirit. We invite you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Commit yourself to his ways through the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for providing the way of faith and salvation, the way of eternal life and a new identity as your child. We thank you for the power of your good news. We thank you for inviting us to be partners in mission and ministry. We thank you, Lord, for equipping us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. Lord, we ask that you teach us to trust and depend on you. Lord, we ask you to teach us how to show love and concern for others in everything that we say and do. Lord, we ask for your protection. We ask for your guidance. We ask for your forgiveness. Replace our fear with faith and courage. Replace our sickness with the healing that only comes from you. Replace our anxiety and our sadness with your peace and your love and your hope and your joy. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. Now my brothers and sisters, go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, render to no one evil for evil, Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people, love and serve God and rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each of us. Amen.